um, the principal, the chair of the school committee, um, the introduction. It's a bit of a Mandua introduction, very long. But thank you very much for that. Uh, parents, students, and of course the graduating students. Uh, it gives me much pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, yesterday I was at Sri uh, Vivekanan College uh, prize giving, and I mentioned a number of things there, some of which I'd like to highlight again here uh, this morning. But uh, normally I don't come to these things with prepared speech. I like to speak uh, off the cuff and essentially trying to gather what is the important issues relating to that particular school and trying to contextualize that within the national um, uh, scene in Fiji and the, and the economy and of course our uh, beloved country. Uh, this school, ladies and gentlemen, plays a very pivotal role. As you know, what we're living now uh, is very much on the, the borderline, if you like, of the rural Nandi and also suburban Nandi. And therefore, this school is uh, quite different to many other schools that may be completely urban-based. So the challenges and the issues faced by uh, the school, the students, the parents, the socioeconomic issues are very different to many of those schools in the urban areas or schools that are purely rural schools. And I'd like to thank the committee uh, for persevering through the years and I know that they've had many challenges and please put your hands together for the committee because we tend to forget how uh, the committee in various schools. I, I, uh, I, I say this ladies and gentlemen because of the past one week uh, we have been involved in the commemoration of the last ship that carried the Girmatiers that came to Fiji in 1916. And we were you know, in a number of centers throughout Fiji. And I just want to highlight to you um, some of the key, um, the, the challenges that these people faced. Because it is in that context, if we want to become a strong country, if these students here who are year 13 students, very soon they'll become parents, very soon they'll be looking for jobs, they'll be graduating from university, they'll be buying their first car, some of them will become businessmen and women, some of them will become employees, some of them may be members of parliament, some of them will become engineers, they become good motor auto uh, mechanics, whatever the case may be. The fact is, as individuals, we need to be able to develop as very healthy individuals. I don't just mean physically, I mean emotionally and mentally and psychologically, because that's what makes a strong country. If we ourselves are strong individually, if we are able to come to terms with who we are, if we are able to accept what has happened in the past and what is going to happen in the future, our future will be a lot brighter. And it is within that context, I think it is very, very important that we forget about it. As I said to the students yesterday at SBC, I said to them, I said, probably the parents won't like this, and this is probably applicable to those of the students who are still you know, in year 9, 10, and 11, and those of you who will be going to university. The students should always study what they want to study. They should choose the subjects they want. Some parents put a lot of pressure. They say, oh, you must do law. You must do accounting. Because they think of other professions as not being, you know, credible enough. But if your child, if the student believes that they are going to make a good carpenter, they'll make a good nurse, they're very interested in automotive mechanics or they're good in engineering, let them do that. Because if they choose to do that and they have a passion for that, they'll be very good at it. You don't want your child, for example, to become an accountant or a lawyer, whatever the case may be. They can get the degree, but they may be quite useless at it. They say, oh, that guy is a useless lawyer, a useless accountant. But if your child, for example, is very interested in nursing, they say she's a good nurse or he's a good nurse. So that's what we should pursue. And this is why government has made education completely free till year 13. I know there are some families over here who are, whose leases have expired, some of them have become squatters now. But can you imagine in the days when you did not have free education, when you had to pay for your fees, those parents probably would have stopped their children from coming to school because they would have had to pay the fees. And now even, if they get a place in a university and they don't get a scholarship, we can still pay for your school fees, your university fees, 
because we have the tertiary education loan scheme. Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, in about three to four years' time, when all of the students who are now coming off from high schools, going to universities or going to technical colleges, we've set up 13 technical colleges throughout Fiji, where those students who do not necessarily want to go to university, but want to, for example, become a good tile layer, want to become a good carpenter, want to become a good pastry chef, all of these skill sets are required. Even they are getting a free education through that, or they get a tertiary education loan scheme. When all of these people graduate, can you imagine the wealth of this country through our human resources potential? They do not necessarily have to get jobs in Fiji, they can get jobs offshore. We find many Fijians, for example, the Bank of South Pacific, for example, uses a lot of Fijians to go and work in Papua New Guinea because there's shortage of skill sets there. They send money back home. Their families build better homes. These are the kind of things that we are looking at. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, within all of this, we always have to feel comfortable as to who we are. We have to feel comfortable as our country. We have to be comfortable with our history. And let me tell you that a lot of our history that we learn in school, that we've been taught in school, is sanitized. In other words, it's been cleaned up. It was cleaned up during the British days. It was cleaned up during post-independence days. One of the things we did do, as I mentioned earlier on, in this uh, commemoration, we actually read out stories of the indentured laborers. Back in the 1970s, an academic called Dr. Ahmed Ali, some of the teachers would know him. He was the Minister for Education for a long period of time. He actually went and interviewed the actual survivors, the Girmetiers, who then were alive. All of them are dead now, of course. It happened a long time ago. But some of them were still were alive in the 1970s. And he went and interviewed them. And he recorded their stories. And he published their stories. And one of the things we did do is that we read their stories in this. Let me read out a couple of these stories. And this is a story of a man called Pancham. And this is what he told. He said, if you were given the task of loading a truck with cane, one had to do so until one had completed it, even if it meant working into the evening. If the truck fell because of bad loading, then one had to restart and complete the task. By the time I had completed my work one night, it was nearly 1 a.m. And when I got home and had cooked and eaten, it was 4 a.m. And at 5 a.m., I had to go back to work for another day. Once the overseer gave us a task and told us we had to finish it, otherwise he would whip us. When he returned at 3 o'clock, some people had not completed the task, so he whipped them as he had promised. Except for three of us in our gang, everyone was beaten. Although there were many of us, we could not combine to retaliate against him. We were frightened because the government would be on his side. The Australian overseers who used to come knew how to herd cattle or drive animals. And this is how they behaved towards human beings as well. They brought the methods they had used on animals and used them in dealing with laborers. It was just as well that indenture lasted only five years. If it had been for six years, I would have preferred to have been dead, even perhaps by my own hands. During the five years, I counted the days each day to find out how many were left. Those five years were five years of hell. There's another story of a man called Lotan. Europeans used to beat up people that did not do their work. Some overseers insisted that if one of us wearing, was wearing a hat, then on meeting them, we must take it off and say salam to them. If we did not oblige, we were punished. They used to call us boy and treat us like children. We did not know what boy meant. At first, we thought boy was a term for something good. When Indians behaved as though they were children, Europeans treated them well. But if they asserted themselves and tried to be like them, then they found themselves in trouble. Assertion of equality led to a threshing. Let me read out the last one. When I was 16, when I, I was 16 when I came to Fiji, I was unmarried and an orphan. 
My parents had died in an academic. This is the story of Mahadeo. I came to Fiji because I was lured. I met a man who asked me if I was looking for work. There was around 200 migrants on my trip. Once we reached Fiji, I was sent to Duvu via Lotoka. I was set the task of cutting grass. If we did not finish our task, our money was not paid because we had not completed our work. There was a South Indian with us. He used to do a lot of singing and dancing, but he was not able to work and he used to get a terrible beating from the overseer. So he took off into the bush and hanged himself. We used to think of home, but what was the purpose of it? Home was so far away, and if we wanted to go, we could not, because we had no money. I saved no money during my indenture. Besides, in any case, I had nobody in India. So for me, there was no person or place to return to. I've got a couple more, sorry, if you don't mind. I left India because I was told I would receive a shilling a day for work in Fiji. I went to Naitasiri to serve my girmit. For a month, I spent my time crying. When I got to Naitasiri, I thought I would never see my parents again. But after shedding tears for a month, I decided I must work despite my despair. On our sugar estate, some who did not learn about cane cultivation was given a thorough beating. Our state was bad enough. There were others, far worse, where people were disgraced completely. I did not like the work at all, but I told myself that if I did not work, I would die of starvation. There were two alternatives, work or a threshing. The story of Lakpat. I asked where I would be sent. On being told it would be Fiji, I inquired of its whereabouts. I was told it was close to Calcutta and I could go there willingly. Since it was not a jail, I could return when I wanted to. I was scared, lest these people were merely luring us someplace where they might kill us. There was a great deal of weeping when we embarked on the ship. People wept because they were leaving their families or their homes. Many of the women were upset because they had been lured away from the marketplace where the recruiter had misled them. I cried because I was leaving everything behind and didn't know where I was going. Nobody knew where Fiji was. These recruiters had misled us and bluffed us into going. I, for instance, had quite a good home. There was no need for me to leave. From Calcutta, we went to Madras and then past Singapore. It took us a month from Singapore before we reached Fiji. Life was very painful on board ship. For a fortnight, I was well. Then I became ill and parts of my body began to swell up. When we arrived in Fiji, we were all herded into a punt like pigs and taken to Nukulau where we, where we stayed for a fortnight. We were given rice that was full of worms. We were kept and fed like animals. The last one. This is the story of Mahabir. There was no conflict with Fijians in those days. If you gave them something, they reciprocated. During indentured days, some Indians would run away and go to a Fijian village. They were given shelter there as well as provided with food. If one took Yangona into a village, then all they would share what they had with you. In very early days, they used to smell the roti first and then throw it away. It was later that they learned to eat it. These, ladies and gentlemen, are some of the experiences, and many people do not know these stories. Many people do not know how they went through this. When I was in Lambasa last Saturday, there were two very elderly people who started crying. You would have seen some photographs in the papers. And the two of these elderly people said that their parents, I think one of them said their grandparent, and the other one was the parents, they said that this is the first time that there was such a public acknowledgement of the Girmit experience. And that was the first time that actually a government was actually uh, creating awareness about it. And they started crying and they said, oh, thank you very much. Now, if you looked at it from one perspective, it was not a big deal. But from another perspective, when things that happen in your country, when things that happen in the past, when things that happen in your individual lives, if you do not talk about it, if you do not vent it, 
you'll always keep it in you. And emotionally and psychologically it will affect you. So if you get married to your husbands and your wives, your bosses when you work, when you, have business, when you become business people, you must be able to vent those issues out. Don't keep it in you. Because if you don't keep it in you, you won't develop as an individual fully. You'll always keep something in the back of your mind. And when you do do that, you'll tend to get angry for things or on things for nothing. So this is a very critical issue. So for Fiji to become more mature, which is what we are becoming, we need to be able to talk about the past. In the same way as I had mentioned, how many people know the story of Dolo? You know, the people up in Dolo in Novosa area, they actually resisted British control. And when the British could not fight them, they brought Itauke people from other parts of Fiji to fight them. And they killed 70 of them. And after that time, the word Keidolo became a, became a derogative term. So today when you say to somebody, oh, Keidolo, it's a derogative term. But it stems from that period. There are many people who, for example, were exiled from Ra to Kandavu that resisted British control. But we don't talk about it. It's not taught in our history. So we need to be able to understand that. 25,000 Itauke people died because of measles in the 1980, uh, 1880s. How many of us know about that? How many of us talk about that? How many of us understand the impact that had on the future political and constitutional development of our country? So I'm not asking all of us to become historians. I'm taking lessons from that to say to us that we need to be honest about our lives. As I always say, when you wake up in the morning, those of you who shave your face, when you wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror to shave your face, make sure you're able to look into the mirror, into your own eyes to say, I can walk around this morning with my head held up high. If you've got some issues, please resolve it. And only that way will you be able to become stronger. Only that way you'll be able to become honest. And this is one of the issues that is very critical in our country at the moment. We need people to be intellectually honest too. Call a fact a fact. Don't try and give it a twist. It's very, very important. So ladies and gentlemen, that is my short message to you. I like in particular for the students. You'll go out, we obviously are very proud of you. We look forward to you contributing to your country. Don't always think that you should always get a job. You could be somebody that could be creating a job. You could become a business person. So always have an open mind about things. And I'd like to again, once again, thank you for the invitation this morning. I'd like to uh, once again apologize to you for the delay. Um, some of these things unfortunately could not be helped. And, uh, and I thank you for your patience uh, in waiting. I wish everybody here a very fantastic morning and also a fantastic Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you very much.